What we wanted to do with the uh, during lunch was to um, give you a flavor of what um, patient engagement activities are going on uh, within the college and also um, have some of our uh, panelists talk a little bit specifically about their particular um, efforts in practice with regard to our CardioSmart initiative. And so really kind of give you a real world type of feel. And again, we want to make, make this very, very open and questions and answers. So, so go ahead and eat. Feel free to get up and get more food, but um, to listen and look up every now and then while, we, uh, while we're talking. So CardioSmart is the um, patient-centered uh, activity of the college. We use CardioSmart as the overarching umbrella of all our activities that are patient-centered. Primarily, or what started as the website, the CardioSmart.org website, but that is not the, the only part of CardioSmart. And I'm going to show you what the CardioSmart ecosystem is um, just at the end of my few slides. We are the American College of Cardiology, and as such, we are very evidence-based. So what did we do when we were thinking about this patient-centered activity in the patient space? Well, we did some research, because that's what we do. And Anne, Anne, wave your hand, did, uh, did, was chair of all this research. And we, we had several phases. We first started um, back in 2011 and did some exploratory research with patients. And then, so we had focus groups. You can see geographically diverse. We talked to patients. And then we decided to ask, well, what about the clinicians? We asked doctors. We asked nurses, pharmacists. Um, and then we actually did in phase three some quantitative research. And what we were looking at was what, what do you need? What do patients need? What do our clinician members need? And we distilled this all into uh, quite a lengthy document, and, and it's something that we continue to go back to to look at what it is that um, people who are practicing and patients who see our, our members need. And I'm just going to show you a few things that we found out that we think are the most important. I want you to note that there were 2,500 patients represented, so that was primarily patients, lots of patients. Um, many more cardiologists than our non-cardiology non members. So when we say what the clinicians think, it, this was driven heavily by our FACC cardiologists. So there was a huge need on the part of, uh, felt on the part of the clinicians for patient education. Um, and this was th just, for this question, this was just directed at the clinicians. So 77% of those clinicians, our members, thought that there was a strong need for patient education. Here's, here's a slide that, that I've, I've shown this a lot because I think this is incredibly compelling. Look down at the bottom and see that in light blue is the clinicians. In orange is the caregiver of the patient. Some, so some caregivers were interviewed as well. And then in the dark blue um, is the patient. So the top box is what the patient thinks. Okay, so the 49% of patients thought they were in good health, 74% were uh, concerned about their health, uh, et cetera. But if you look below that dividing line, I want to show you the, now, the, the difference in what the clinicians thought about the patients and what the patients thought. So patients, um, good self-care, 74% of the patients thought they were good at their own self-care. And look at what the cardiologist thought. Yeah, so there, the patient's perception of how life's going is very different. Yeah, right. Bray's like this. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the caregiver also pretty distinctly different than, so the caregiver looks differently at, at how the patient, the caregiver doesn't think the patients are doing as good a job either. So there's a, there's a real mismatch here in, in what we're thinking. So here's the other great, this is, I, I pulled these two slides out because I think they're so important. So this is, okay, the patient-educated education provided by physicians. Again, the clinicians are in light blue and the patients are in dark blue. So 85% of the doctors surveyed thought they were handing out brochures. And 58% of the patients said, you are handing out brochures. Now, these weren't matched to the practices, but they were across geography. So the doctors surveyed thought, oh, yeah, our oh, yeah we do that, you know, but they're not. Um, so there was a big disconnect there. And then the most, uh, the other striking thing on this on this graph is 
no, 19% of the patients said they were given no education at all. And that's not something that the, the clinicians even acknowledged. 19% of the patients said they were given no education by their doctor's office. So that's some of the information we found out from surveying patients. These are the resources that were, of all the CardioSmart tools available, 25% of both patients and clinicians thought the website was very important. And then there were, there were differences, interestingly. Um, at the very top of the clinician side, you'll see that the, the physicians were um, really captivated by CardioSmart TV. They thought that was a good portal. Um, they also were very interested in live events. That does not even appear on what the patients wanted. Um, so this is kind of similar to the slide Susie showed about you know the, the surgeons thinking that, as far as the breast cancer patient, what was important to the patient. 14% of the patients wanted decision aids, and this didn't even show up on the list of the, of the doctors. So there's still a little bit of uh, disparity between clinicians and patients, but there's a lot of commonality there. And we, we took this information to heart in developing um, the CardioSmart uh, ecosystem. And, and here is the what we call the CardioSmart ecosystem. Um, in the lower right is the, you can see the uh, web portal, and on CardioSmart, there are um, the so in the at at two o'clock is cardiosmart.org. That is the patient portal where patients or caregivers can go or clinicians, anybody who wants, can go in, get patient education and information on support with regard to whatever disease process they're looking at. Uh, we also have on CardioSource. There's actually a CardioSmart community, and that's to help draw our own members who are every day on CardioSource into more understanding of what's going on on CardioSource and actually drive traffic that way. We have CardioSmart text, a text message program. One of the things we rolled out um, a year ago, November, on National Quit Day was you could go on CardioSmart and sign up for texting to quit smoking. So there's several different um, text message um, uh, surveys or not messaging going out for for health. I think the ACC um, staff participated in some health messaging uh, for a while. I know because I signed up and I was getting inundated with messages about how I should walk the stairs and all this kind of stuff, you know, and I'm already walking the stairs. Um, the Heart Explorer app, very important, is a um, application that you can download onto your iPad. And I, as a clinician, can show my patient many different um, anatomic um, pictures of different things. Like I, if I'm going to talk about an ablation procedure, there's actually, you can show the entire system of um, the AV node, et cetera. They're beautiful. Um, watch this space because we're going to be developing more. The most recent addition is CardioSmart TV, and we're really, really proud of this. Um, we have a lot of member interest in placing uh, CardioSmart content in their waiting rooms, and so CardioSmart TV will provide that to our practices who um, sign up to be CardioSmart practices. Um, it's about it's going to be about a 30-minute loop of content directed at specific. Uh, disease processes, et cetera, practices can actually take this um, and modify it for their own practice. So you can do some messaging of your own if you have content specific to your practice. And um, for those who've already uh, signed up, and we have a few pilots going on, they, uh, Dave May, who's the chair of our Board of Governors, um, sent out a, a picture one Monday morning showing that in his waiting room in just outside of Dallas, the, a patient had... Uh, his front office uh, check-in person called him and said, David, Dr. May, you got to come over here. And here this lady had turned one of the uh, waiting room chairs around just so she could watch the TV on Cardius Martin. So Dave sent that all out to us. So so we think it's going to be a big win. It's it's just rolling out now to our first few practices. So that's, that's our Cardius Smart ecosystem. Um, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to ask the um, – we're going to – have the other members of the panel um, talk a little bit, and then we'll kind of open it up. So um, the, per the person I'm going to ask to um, talk first is um, Deborah. I have to say this right. 
Flaherty Kaiser. So as you introduced yourself before, you're both um, a CardiSmart uh, patient advocate and a women heart champion. And would you tell us your story and how you came to CardioSmart and how in a day -to, on a day-to-day -day basis as a, as a patient, tell us how you interact with CardioSmart. Can I talk a little bit about my story first? Please, please do. The stage. It's, I'm honored to be here today. This is a really great um, convening of, of the medical professionals, pharmaceutical people, and, and patients like myself. Um, she'll never live. Those were the first words a new mother heard from the attending nurse when her child was born. The baby was blue, weighed less than four pounds, and had some type of heart problem. That newborn was me. I never really understood what condition I had or what the severity of it was. My pediatrician only noted that I had a heart murmur. Of course, in hindsight, I can appreciate that in the late 1950s, medical science and diagnostic tools weren't where they are today making a complete diagnosis difficult. I only knew that I got tired easily during gym class and had trouble keeping off weight. I wouldn't say my parents and I were in denial about my condition, but we were certainly ignorant and uninformed. Looking back, two events impacted how I view my heart condition. First, I was determined from an early age to attend the Naval Academy. My dad was an academy graduate and had died serving his country when I was six months old. It was my long-standing goal to honor his memory and attend the academy. Well, it seemed my wish would come true. I was selected to be in the first group of women candidates at the academy, pending medical clearance. I had passed all the other tests, including the fitness test, so I didn't foresee any problems. It was when I had to go a comprehensive medical exam that my congenital issues became more clear. I was denied admission to the academy because I had Epstein's anomaly, and they determined that would be too much of a risk. For the first time, well, I was devastated, and for the first time, I felt discriminated against because of my condition. Second, I always felt somewhat alone, not knowing anyone with any congenital heart issue, much less Epstein's. One day at work, I was discussing weekend plans with a colleague and just happened to mention that I was going to Boston for my annual cardiologist visit. She inquired why I was traveling so far. We lived in New Jersey at the time. And I informed her that I had this you know, crazy, rare condition called Epstein's. She broke down in tears, and I couldn't understand why. She, through her tears, told me that her daughter, newborn, had just been diagnosed with Epstein's and had been told babies with Epstein's don't make it to adulthood. She said knowing that I had this condition gave her hope, and seeing her pain turn to joy made me want to become an advocate for women's heart health and heart health in general. In general. So those events led me to be accepted to and applied um, to the 2010 Women Heart Science and Leadership Symposium at the Mayo Clinic. And women, I became a national patient volunteer professionally trained to help educate, support, and advocate for women living with heart disease. And as a national volunteer for Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease, I am honored to share my story and hopefully inspire women to lead a heart-healthy lifestyle. Websites such as womenheart.org and cardiosmart.org inspire women and men to lead heart-healthy lifestyles and understand more about heart disease. I particularly find helpful how Cardiosmart supports patient-centered care by encouraging patients to equip themselves with the tools they need to manage their health. The up-to-date information, message boards, heart healthy guidelines help me feel connected to others with my condition and provide me with the knowledge I need to be an informed and involved patient. Also, I'm one of these type A personalities. I love having an easy way to track my exercise, blood pressure, which provides additional data points for my doctors. CardioSmart helps me be an empowered patient who is participating in, not just receiving care. 
One of the most important things I have learned on my heart journey is patients must take control of their health. It is the patient's responsibility to become a smart, educated healthcare consumer. Doctors are, of course, an important and integral part of the team, but it's critical that patients become knowledgeable about their personal and individual health issues and encourage honest two-way communication between themselves and their health care providers. And no matter what their area of expertise, doctors need to look at the whole patient and not just consider their specialty when treating a patient. One benefit, of course, of technology today is that it enables my doctors, who are all over the country, to easily share test, encounter, and treatment plan results. And treating the whole patient, to me, means going beyond the numbers. At a recent appointment about three weeks ago, my cardiologist noted that my weight hadn't decreased as much as she would have liked. However, she commented that I looked more toned and she could hear my heart better. The obvious impacts of a more ambitious exercise routine that I could back up with my CardioSmart log, which, by the way, having this exercise log made her question the value and interpretation of my stress test because seeing what I had done and the results, they weren't compatible. So this has led her to question the validity of stress tests when it comes to Epstein's patients, and she is looking at devising a study for this. Patient-centered care means patients must work with doctors to actively create health, not just avoid disease. And this is a change, I think, for both doctors and patients. Patients must take ownership of those things they can change to stay or get healthy and make a plan with their health care provider to address them. And CardioSmart helps with this. And even I found small changes can make a big difference. One challenge to effective patient-centered care that you may not be able to impact but is important is the insurance bureaucracy. As a patient with complex medical needs, I find it somewhat insulting that every year I have to go through the same lengthy approval process to see my cardiologist, who I've been seeing for years at a recognized congenital health center because it happens to be out of network. Hmm. Finally, last year I was very nervous about an appointment with my cardiologist. Again, she had expected me, and this was two years ago, the end of last year, she had expected me to lose 50 pounds, and I think I lost two. But because of my relationship, I felt comfortable sharing with her what I had been going through. My parents had moved in with us. My mother had two heart attacks, diagnosed with lung cancer. You throw in a new crazy puppy, two cats, two ferrets, two young adults living at home with their assorted friends, and you get the picture. <laughs> Stress alone could have caused me to gain 50 pounds. But my cardiologist and I sat down, and we got a plan to get back on track. I am now exercising 200 minutes a week, at least, and in a moment of insanity, signed up to walk a half marathon this October. So I feel confident because of my relationship with my doctors that my goals are realistic and, and attainable. And CardioSmart has given me the motivation and inspiration I need. Awesome. awesome. Uh, Dr. Dustman, you've had some experience, direct experience in your practice. You're one of the innovators in using CardioSmart in your practice. Can you tell us what you've been doing and how it's going? Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, not sure I want to follow such a personal statement. It <laughs> was wonderful. Um, you know, our use of uh, CardioSmart really came out of one of practicality. Um, we have a relatively large cardiology practice, uh, 24 cardiologists, a large uh, staff. And as we try to drive patient education and engagement, um, you know, really making changes in a, in a large practice can be pretty difficult. Um, and so 
we wanted to introduce CardioSmart. We wanted to really figure out what's the workflow implications, and then really the resources that would be required for those workflow changes, can we really demonstrate that we're accomplishing actually what, we're, what we set out to do? So I'm fortunate every summer we host about 40 students, medical students or college students, in doing uh, relatively small research projects. We've done that for over 25 years, and so I was able to uh, have a, a junior college student and a sophomore medical student uh, for the summer, and we combined shadowing and other things with that. But um, with Catherine's uh, prompting with, uh, from the team and uh, uh, some willing students, uh, we set out to try to figure out, you know, practically how can we re-engineer cardiology practice around this. So we started out looking at 100 patients. And at baseline, we wanted to assess their health literacy, their internet experience. Uh, we also uh, had each one fill out a, a patient activation uh, measure, uh, which is a validated uh, tool to really see what their level of activation for their own health and, um, and self-centeredness would be. We, ran, we gave that information. Uh, additionally, we uh, uh, used an information prescription. There's a form by the American College of Cardiology that lists a whole variety of common conditions in uh, common language. And with the physician's direction, uh, we were able to pinpoint specific diagnoses for each patient. So we had about 100, we had 100 patients, and when, then we decided what are the resources that are required to try to drive traffic to CardioSmart, uh, uh, smart, which is really our, was our primary goal. So we, we randomized the patients. Uh, the control group really got some printed materials, information about the website. Um, uh, they all took the surveys. Uh, the other 50, we've randomized to an uh, intervention group where the students spend about 10, 15 minutes with them, actually showing in the website, kind of driving uh, some of the sites, things like that. And with the ACC's help, we are able to tr uh, uh, track logins. So what I'm going to talk about today is really preliminary. We're sort of in the middle of the project, honestly. Um, but I can draw some early conclusions. The study patients, now it's voluntary, so the patients were approached in the exam room by the nurse and oh, would you be interested in speaking with some students about a project? So uh, certainly that was sort of the entry uh, into who might be interested in participating. Um, but from our group, a couple things. Our group was educated. Now, mind you, our practice is a very typical Midwest practice. We see hundreds of patients a day. Um, and the demographics are very uh, uh, varied. So, um, you know, uh, you know, we we serve all uh, economic, socio-economic uh, groups. So the groups that the group the, are that turned out demographically in this study really highly educated, um, almost to the person had insurance or Medicare. Uh, I would say we had very little patient participation that had Medicaid. Um, the, the group was not represented by minorities. Um, they had good perception of their own health. And they actually scored very high on, on activation scores uh, right out of the, uh, at the baseline. Uh, so I would say just from those demographics alone, certainly not the highest risk group that we serve, which, you know, was a finding, I would say, a little bit of a disappointment to, a, to some degree. Um, but. Our early results show at least 25% have been driven to the site, and, and, and many m multiple times. So we can't give any feedback on exactly uh, what they were looking at. Um, I don't have that data currently. Um, but our goal is to try to figure out, over time, will that percentage increase? We have some interventions planned. Uh, we have some resurveys planned. And then uh, part of the resurvey uh, questions are some questions from the ACC about the site uh, utility itself, so we can provide some feedback and try to further enhance the resource. Um, you know, at, at around 25%, my initial inclination was, I don't know why it wouldn't be closer to 100%, because we spent time with them. And I think it kind of points to some of the issues that, we, that were outlined earlier. Patient activation is a very difficult thing. And when I, when I tried to draw parallels, um, one that came to mind was um, the use of electronic health record, and in particular, either the patient portal to an electronic health record or their own portable personal health record. 
And you know, the penetrance nationally is probably 15%. So I think that um, you know, our drive to uh, online resource is, is probably not that far off, maybe exceeds in a certain sense uh, some of the experience on other venues for patients. Um, so what are we trying to do now uh, as far as uh, CardioSmart as a resource? You know, we're trying to brand it uh, as, a, as our educational site of preference. Um, we want to use a physician-driven information prescription. It looks like a prescription, it has diagnoses, and it's very pinpoint as far as which diagnoses would be most applicable to a patient to learn more about their conditions. Um, I think CardioSmart TV will help because in the waiting room, there'll be more branding of the CardioSmart uh, name, and I think that the, 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 the uh, array of um, offerings by CardioSmart, I think it'll become more mm -hmm. familiar. Um, we want to, we're going to message in our patient portal uh, through links and also we can message in, uh, in the portable uh, patient health record that's available. Um, one statistic that kind of, I, I was sort of interested where patients got their information and it, it probably maybe to no surprise, at least one statistic I saw, 85% of patients that search for medical information, it's Google, Bing, and Yahoo. And, um, you know, um, WebMD is around 16% as one, as one of the sites. And, you know, that's fine, but, you know, I think all of us have used Google before. And, uh, you know, you sift through, you know, thousands of sites, uh, uh, citations. And I think for a, pa a patient group that, um, you know, it almost struggles to get it, to have enough self-confidence to try to search out their own information and activate their their, uh, their own behavior towards uh, their own health. I think we have, it, 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 you know, it's just as important, I think, to try to narrow their universe of information for them if we can. So I think that's what our goal is uh, regarding uh, CardioSmart. Um, and then the other thing that was glaring is I'm not sure and I can almost guarantee that we did not capture the highest risk patients in our, in our practice uh, to, to be even engaged in a study. And so, you know, how can we improve whatever demographic we want to look at, whether, you know, improve their own education, their own self-confidence, which is really what is, is behind activation, uh, and then how do we tailor the educational needs on a, on a source like CardioSmart. So I think that will be a challenge. Um, that's sort of a picture of, of how we're trying to practically use a resource uh, in a, in a large uh, uh, cardiology practice. Uh, thank you. So I, I had a question for you. We had a little um, casual conversation um, before we got started here. And you, you talked about how office visits could maybe be re-engineered. So do you think there's a potential in the future for like practices to have like kiosks in their waiting room or somehow within the walls of the practice where patients could kind of be introduced to the cardio smart resources like right on site like either while they're waiting or somehow integrate that into the visit i think definitely i think there there has to be multiple approaches and and we can't treat every patient the same as far as um our approach uh to, uh, to help them uh, activate uh, to their own health um I mentioned the CardioSmart TV. I think that's probably going to be our next wave of some sort of, it's not interactive, but certainly educational. Um, I, I think that um, using advanced level uh, nurse practitioners, um, I think um, I, we have visits designed more for education, uh, more for these type of uh, uh, efforts. Um, and then one of the gentlemen earlier, I think, hit on the, the real issue, and that is everything we're talking about today is a, is a really value-driven uh, approach to healthcare, and we live in a volume-driven world, and so there's a definite mismatch. Um, I don't think that's going to be solved anytime soon, and so I know in our own health system, um, I'm certainly an advocate, and the health system itself uh, is responsive to be able to make an investment in the value side, uh, which, which really kind of underpins some of the stuff we're talking about. But uh, until that whole issue gets uh, resolved, uh, we'll, we're always going to be 
sort of at a dissonance uh, with all this stuff, I think. Thanks, Ray. Susie, can you um, talk to us? I know you're not in clinical practice anymore, but can you give us a view of what, how the nursing use of Cardiosmore, both your experience and also uh, what colleagues have said to you in the nursing Sure, profession? and I think, you know, um, surveys have told us that patients still and clinicians still rely on kind of print pieces, um, most of all. So kind of those downloadable one-page uh, condition sheets are really important go-to uh, pieces for nurses. Um, when you talked earlier about um, the survey about do we give out brochures or patient ed in the office, um, I think you know what some of those look like of old. They've been copied many times and maybe were crooked and maybe they were outdated by the time somebody accessed them. So the ability to be able to um, go to a site that you know it's up to date, um, you know it's credible, you know it's vetted, and be able to hand those to patients I think is extremely valuable. And then I was thinking when you were talking about the ablation, there are certain things when we try to explain to patients, it doesn't quite work with your hands. You know, when someone says, they told me my heart was operating at 40% and it's their ejection fraction, so they think that's out of 100. And to try to get that concept of filling and ejection uh, fraction and that to patients, I think the Explorer is just a, a really dynamite tool. So those two things I would say would be key. Yeah, so CardioSmart, the Explorer app actually allows that when we're talking about AFib, this is what every cardiologist does to explain AFib. Right? The atria are going like this, so you can actually use this app and show AFib and explain why the clot forms, right? So, questions for our panelists? This is sort of real world how we're practicing now and awaiting CardioSmart TV for everybody. Yes. Sorry. Um, how are you using these resources to reach out to caregivers? So the answer to that is if you if you pull up card if you're online right now you can pull up CardioSmart and you'll see that the entrance portal you can identify yourself as a patient or a caregiver. So different content, related content but different. So um, through the patients is how we're reaching out because the patients in going to be in the exam room and in the waiting room, but frequently there's a caregiver there too. So so we're kind of messaging to both at the same time. Yes. To um, your point about point, uh, patient activation, getting them to CardioSmart and Susie's point about utilizing kiosks and sort of sort, I think there may be a value of looking at uh, using a tablet at the point of care, right? So you can share, oh, here's a CardioSmart and just get them to be engaged so they, they, they recognize it and like they feel a little more comfortable initiating that, uh, that engagement. So there may be some value there. I don't know if you've looked at that. I'm bringing it up because it's not a new idea because diabetes educators, they uh, gave away 2,000 uh, tablets at their uh, meeting a couple, about a month ago. So that's how they're engaging the patient interaction that way. So they, I mean, they gave them away to the attendees of the uh, conference, so the, the practitioners. Right. To, right, diabetes educators, right. 2,000 of them? You, you know, one thing that strikes me, I, I actually hadn't thought of that. We have computers in every room, uh, but, you know, they're so electronic health record specific, um, and, you know, uh, and then the whole privacy issue around that, but uh, it's a, actually a very good idea. And the other thing that just struck me as you mentioned it, um, not that there would be any waiting time in our office, but on the <laughs> chance on an off day that there could be, there could be a minute or two, um, you know, actually having our nursing team um, uh, be able to demonstrate and let them sort of surf the site as they wait. Right. Um, actually, I think that's a great idea, yeah. honestly. Yeah, and some of our members are carrying their own iPads around in their coats now and showing and show and demonstrating CardioSmart. And I will tell you, this is a little bit of dirty laundry, I suppose, but when, when formulating the content for this CardioSmart TV, you know, I think our, our staff and people are developing great, this is going to be a 30 minute loop, and I said, oh no, that's too short. Because if a patient waits all the way through the loop, 
that's just, you know, like, but there's no waiting in our practice either. No. <laughs> but 30 minutes is a little too short to have a loop. We, we were, we we're kind of going for 45, so. Thinking about waiting time, I uh, am really impressed as a patient when I do not stay in the outside waiting room for very long, where I do think you could engage me, and uh, as you'll hear in a few minutes, I'm one of your patients, um, is the time between the time the medical assistant leaves the examining room and you come in. And I would be all over that, uh, that iPad in the Cardio mm -hmm. Smart during that waiting period. Great suggestion. Yes, ma'am. So as I've learned more about CardioSmart, I think it's definitely a, a fantastic tool, but I can see the challenge to your point as far as the more underserved and high-risk patient population. So has ACC started thinking about strategies to, to help bring these tools to these patients in, in a user-friendly way where they can truly adopt them and, and benefit from them? One of the target markets is to, uh, for our members who are serving underserved populations with both CardioSmart TV and just, in, there, and there's several members very active in our um, working groups who are in practices just as you're describing, so that is a goal. And I'll, and I'll also add to that, that point, um, Dr. Walsh, that we, we pride ourselves on also being able to partner with other organizations who have a specialty and a focus on some of those populations. Um, particularly with Andre in the, the Association of Black Cardiologists, as well as Women Heart, Mended Hearts, and other organizations, so that we can really have an impact in those communities also. And if I could comment as well, I, I've done some research on congenital heart patients, and a very interesting thing I found out was a lot of congenital patients feel fine, look fine, don't think they need to be seen by a cardiologist. So the extent that the website can be used to kind of pull them in and say, hey, you know, you really should be seen at an adult congenital clinic and followed up that, you know, there's issues as you grow older. So I think it's a valuable tool for that as well. So just as an individual, what's your favorite part of the, of the website? So what, what do you use the most yourself? I like the tracking. Because tracking. it has really forced me to take my blood pressure every day. And like I said, I'm this crazy type A. I need to have, you know, and an engineer by training, I guess. So I need to have the data and all that. So that, to me, has been helpful. And also the information about Epstein's I found very helpful because it's not a very common um, condition. And it's hard to find reliable information. So, so. so that was, there was news. That was news to you, even though you had known about your mm -hmm. disease state for a long time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, like you said, the way they present the information. The best thing my cardiologist ever did for me in Boston was she drew me a picture. And that's, oh, it makes sense now. She didn't have the Explorer app for Epstein's. Well, this was, this, no, <laughs> I don't think we had computers back then. But. I don't think we've done Epstein's yet, have we, Michael? I don't think so. But just seeing it, it helped me because other people would ask me, well, what do you have? And I'd say, well, I, but the, having that picture, I could kind of show them, well, this is what it does, and this is why it does it. Oh, you know, so that, that was really helpful. So mention was made to disparate populations, um, and you've discussed sort of content development. What drives the decision in terms of priorities and new content on CardioSource? Yeah, the, that's a really good question. Um, so the Patient-Centered Care Committee is along with um, CardioSmart Editor-in-Chief Joanne Foody are kind of have the oversight for that. And both Ray and Susie are members of our committee, and there's several others. Um, and so with feedback from our members who are already um, working with CardioSmart, we take all that into consideration and then try to rank, you know, what we think is the most important. But it's, it's really feedback first um, because, we, you know, we are a member-driven society and we want to, well, the interface between our members and the patients is really where we think our sweet spot is and we want to deliver um, clinician-driven patient education and so we're, really, we're in a constant resurvey mode of our members, both who are using CardioSmart and who are not, but the oversight is with our um, committee. 
And, and Dr. Foody, as she apologizes, I should have said that before, she is our editor-in-chief of CardioSmart, and she oversees all the content of the web and the, these other things that you're seeing. Yes, sir. So, so you mentioned uh, clinician-driven content, uh, and that's what uh, CardioSmart's bringing to patients. Um, I guess before I get into my question, a quick personal story. My wife uh, was pregnant over a year ago. She's a type 1 diabetic. First doctor's appointment we ch she had uh, chalked up as a high-risk uh, pregnancy. Uh, her clinician wrote down on a yellow post in a three apps. She effectively prescribed her applications to help manage her condition during a pregnancy. Um, so thinking about that concept of prescribing apps, is that an opportunity for CardioSmart to get into and or the industry um, in terms of providing additional support and service to patients? Not, not so much information, but live support, online support, and things like that. And is in, can the industry participate in that? Michael, you want to answer that one? Michael Hargett, Business Development, he's all things cardio smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think that is, that's, a, that's a great opportunity. That is a direction that we're looking at. It's really looking at um, all of the different ways that individuals consume content. And obviously now digital and through apps is one of the major ways. And we do believe that there is a role, um, an appropriate role for industry to play in helping us develop those appropriate apps and partnering with us on the content side and using your expertise perhaps on the technical side and the distribution side of it. So that would be, a, 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 I think, an appropriate relationship for, for the two parties to play. We've, we've been in the process of developing apps for members. For, I mean, that's a new vista for us too. And so we see similarly for our patients that we want to move into that space as well. Other questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>